My name is Sean Drujo, and I'm one of the rangers here at Lon Lozi. I've been in the bush now for about 15 years or so. It's been a life that I've always dreamt of. And while I was pursuing this passion of mine to one day come and live and work out here, I found myself in the confines of university walls while I was doing my master's degree in zoology. And it was during this time that I actually found that I was very much a scientist at heart. We can be a pretty stubborn bunch at times. Okay, we thrive off of facts and we question just about everything. But then there was an encounter that I had a couple of years back that made me start to realize that maybe this desperate need to always try and understand and rationalize everything was starting to blind me in many ways. And it began with the arrival here of a woman named Sean Cheshire. Eight years before Sean arrived at Londolozi, she suffered a brain injury and she lost her eyesight. And so today, Sean is completely blind. And she came out here and I was assigned to take her out on safari. And quite frankly, I didn't really know what to expect or how I was going to handle this. Then we headed out on our first afternoon game drive. We made our way down towards this watering hole. And from the first time that I switched off that engine, I could tell that this was going to be unlike any other safari experience I'd ever taken before. The scientist within me had identified about seven different species of birds and I had these Latin names running through my mind. And I turned around to Sean and her family. I was just about to launch into the breeding biology of an African jacana and the gestation period of a hippo and she couldn't see any of this around her. And I realized in that moment that if Sean was going to truly appreciate what was in and around this watering hole, I had to keep quiet. Because sometimes it's only when we stop making a noise that we really start to tune into things. And I decided that I was going to try and visualize this in a different way and I closed my eyes. And I started to pay attention to the sounds around me. I could hear the wing beats of a heron as it flew across the watering hole and then landed onto a perch waiting there for fish. And I could hear this call of an African fish eagle flying in. I could hear these two hippos starting to fight with each other. And then this fight died down and you could slowly hear the waves starting to settle again. And I could hear baboons grunting in the fig tree just up to my right hand side, dropping fruits down onto the ground. When I opened my eyes again, I realized that Sean's presence had forced me to look using my ears. We started to make our way down towards the Sand River. And as we drove down onto the sandy beach, my tracker spotted a pride of lions. I drove up next to these lines and we switched off the engine of the car. Now I'd known that before she'd lost her eyesight, Sean probably had a good idea of what a lion looked like. But I really wanted her to know what this lion looked like. And so for the first time in my guiding career, I started to describe to someone what a lion looked like. Now I've seen hundreds of lions over the last 15 years. In fact, I realized that I'd been seeing so many lions that I stopped seeing lions. And we all do this in our lives. We stop looking at what is right in front of us. But she made me look at that line again. And I noticed things in that line that I've never seen in any line before. I noticed that amongst the tawny coat, there were these tiny flecks of black hair. I looked at these paws, which were facing upwards towards me, and I could see the bits of river sand just between her toes. And these muscular forearms tapered into these biceps and strong shoulders lioness was missing her tail, which is something I'd seen before, but I looked even closer this time and I could see where all the hair had grown over all the scars that the hyenas had inflicted on her all those years ago. She was panting with this bright pink tongue moving in and out with these backward facing barbs on it. On her nose were all these scars from the battles that she'd been in. And as I was looking at this lioness, I suddenly realized that I could see her life reflected in her body. I'd never looked at a lion like that before. If when you've been out here for 15 years and suddenly someone from a foreign land comes here and starts to show you more than you could show them in less than 12 hours, you suddenly realize that they are guiding you into your own environment. And that is not something that happens every day. The 
The next day we went out on a walk. The sound of the engine was getting a bit distracting for Sean. We were discussing how the walk was going to go and I said that if we came across anything dangerous, that Sean was to grab me by my arm and I would whisk her off to safety. See, I thought I had to keep her safe. Meanwhile, she would hear things so far in advance that she probably kept me a lot safer than I managed to keep her. Sean would always walk with a graphite cane. And as we started walking, I noticed she took the cane and she folded it up into four pieces. And she then started to follow me through the middle of the African bush by listening to the sound of my footsteps. And we walked like this for hours. We walked down towards the Sand River. On the banks of the Sand River was a massive jackalberry tree. And it had this dark green crown. But what was particularly interesting about this jackalberry was that its trunk was caked with mud. And at some stage during the day, an elephant must have had a mud bathe and then come and stand next to the tree and had a good scratch with its shoulder. And I'd explained this whole scenario to Sean. And the first thing she did, put her arms around the tree to try and get a sense of how big this tree was. And her arms didn't even come close to touching on the other side of that tree. And then she took her hand and she placed it onto where the elephant had been rubbing the mud and she ran her hand up and up and up until she couldn't reach any higher but she could still feel the wet mud. She was trying to get a sense of how tall an elephant is and her hand didn't even come close to where its shoulder had actually been. And after that we took off our shoes and we walked in the sand river in the shallow depths and we could feel the water flowing over our feet and I could feel the sand between my toes. And I realized that Sean had helped me to get in, in touch with my sense of feeling. And later on that afternoon, we came across two leopards mating. It can be a bit of a raucous affair sometimes, a lot of spitting and growling and snarling. And then something incredible happened. So the leopards were mating on the left-hand side of the vehicle. She turned to the right-hand side of the vehicle and she pointed and she said to me, I think there's another leopard over there. And I looked in the direction that she had pointed and I could see nothing but a clump of bushes and I was pretty skeptical at the time. I thought, you know, leopards are solitary animals, there's already two leopards here, the probability of there being a third here is pretty low. And I looked at this bush and all I could see was leaves. And suddenly there was a bit of movement behind those leaves. And lo and behold, there was another leopard that walked out from behind that bush. Now, I don't know how she knew that leopard was there. I thought maybe she'd heard it. And I said to her, how did you know that that was there? And she said to me, Sean, since I've lost my sight, I've learned to feel things and escape around me. And this is something that took me a little while to get my head around, but this is only really a concept that's a bit wacky and woo-woo to someone from a Western society. To a lot of the tribes that live close to the earth, no, the whole point is to feel what's going on around you. And what I was starting to realize with the time that I was spending with Sean is that there are other ways of being in relation with nature that don't always come from understanding it. You know, St. Francis once said, wherever you go, preach the gospel, but only where absolutely necessary, use words. It was getting dark at this point and we were driving back towards camp. And all I could see was what was up ahead of me in the vehicle headlights. And as we were driving back, we came around the bend and there was this herd of elephants walking down the road towards us. Now, sometimes the lights can bother elephants, so I switched off the vehicle headlights and I switched off the lights of the radio. But when all the lights were off, it was dark. And I suddenly got quite nervous. And these elephants were walking down the road towards us. I couldn't see what they were doing. I thought, I don't actually know if this is safe. And then I stopped. And I started to remember all the things that I'd learned over the past few days. And I decided that even though it was dark outside, I would still close my eyes. I realized that I could pinpoint the position of every single one of those elephants. And I could hear their feet slowly scraping along the ground as they walked towards us. And I could hear one elephant take a trunk full of sand and throw it over his back very gently. I could hear them slowly picking branches and leaves off of the trees around us. And I could feel their presence and I could sense their mood. And I knew that we were completely safe. And I realized that in our time together, Sean had taught me how to notice things and pay attention to them. 
and that by awakening that within me, she'd made me aware. And it was in that moment that I realized that Sean was the one who taught me how to sing.